if and will, I wonder if you wouldn't mind um, starting the MDT a little bit early. Will, are you still there? Uh, I am, yeah. Hey, do you want to go first or what do you want? Uh, yes, yeah, I've got, in fact, I've got two cases. I was greedy. So why don't I do one short one, you do yours, and then probably will have run out of time, but I have a spare one. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so, I would have thought after three years of pandemic, we'd all be used to this. Okay, fine. So that should be sharing now. You can see us going. Does that say MDT cases? And that, yeah, yeah. It does. perfect. So yes, I was greedy and put more than one in. So we'll just do one. Um, so um, we've had a few really interesting ones, and I, I thought they would be worth pointing out. One, because they're slightly unusual, and again, I hope interesting. Two, they've got some great TCGs, and three, it has impact on family screening, which I think is um, is, is interesting. So this um, this starts in fetal life, actually. So um, the first pregnancy to two healthy parents, absolutely no family history, and fetal bradycardia is noted. And um, further reviews are taken, and in fact, it's more than just bradycardia, there is intermittent sinus bradycardia, this is at 34 weeks of gestation, and going into ventricular tachycardia. Now, I understand from fetal colleagues and, and look at, having looked around this now that, that diagnosing VT is really, really quite uncommon in, in fetal life. Unfortunately, the, the, the um, fetus was known to have quite poor ventricular function and, um, and probably because of the tachycardia uh, inducing a cardiomyopathy and had started to develop high drops. The mother was admitted to some magnesium and metoprolol um, and slowly that rhythm was uh, brought under control. Importantly, both of the parents were screened with 12 lead ECGs initially and felt to be entirely normal. And this, I think, probably, I'm not sure you could say never, but I suspect incredibly rarely would ever see outside of neonatal or paediatric life. Um, this is uh, the first ECG. Um, the child was deliberately started uh, almost directly onto Esmolol after birth. Um, but actually what you can see here is a functional form of two to one AV block. And the reason I say functional is because the the level of block is certainly well below the AV node. And in fact, oh, that doesn't blow up that well, sorry. But there you go. I mean, the, the QT interval, well, well over 600. And though P waves are um, ready to conduct, I'm sure the AV node is functioning fine, but it's coming down into a myocardium, which is still uh, definitely uh, in the process of repolarizing with that hugely lengthened QT interval. So this is a functional two to one block starts having some more relatively unusual morphology and at least one different morphology of ectopy. And again, I should point out that I know exactly how old this child is because um, they were born the day before my first service week as a consultant and um, someone enthusiastically put them down under my name having um, known of my enthusiasm for all things uh, EP. Um, and so this is the first child that was put under my name as a consultant, and this is her ECG that followed. So I knew that I was probably in for a bit of a rough ride here. Um, she would spontaneously go in and out of polymorphic uh, ventricular tachycardia and then into a slower either sinus bradycardia or with functional two to one block. And this was her course over both fetal life delivery at 38 weeks, weighing a fairly good weight. And then what we tried to get on top of using a variety of medications with an unknown genotype at this point. Um, so weaning off the Esmolol onto some really quite high doses of Nadolol. Um, I tried Mixilatine um, on the basis that it can work in long QT3, but actually as we've just, as I've just illustrated it, it, there is some effect in some of the other long QTs. And slowly we weaned down the dependence on magnesium, which I'm not sure contributed a huge amount once it was given orally. And then we've got her genetics back, and this is where genetics can be really, really helpful. And um, this is a um, de novo mutation. Neither of her parents were affected, and this was their first child. 
in the uh, log QT2 gene, KCNH2, potassium channel. And this is what we observed on the ward, and this was a repeated phenomenon. So you could see that, and I should point out, by the way, that as scary as these look, she always looked entirely well. Um, and the bradycardias um, were intermittent, so she had periods of sinus rhythm where she would conduct um, one to one across the avian node into the, um, uh, and the heart rate would increase. And during those times of relatively higher heart rate, so let's say 110, 120 beats per minute, she would never have VT. But what I noticed is that it was always at the slower intervals where a ventricular ectopic would come in during bradycardia and initiate the VT. So the options for a four kilogram um, child at this point are persist with medical management. She had already been in hospital for um, around four weeks by this point. Um, do you brave it and say actually she's in and out of VT, but she's never been affected by it? Maybe she should go home and we should have some monitoring there with a reveal device. Or do you try and do something about that? And there's a, a caveat here that both um, implanting ICD as well as a left cardiac sympathetic innovation um, are really quite technically challenging at this age group. So we took the final option, which was to put a, a single lead. Um, this is a microny generator, so the well, smallest available. Hello. Hey, Edzifa, um, just to interrupt, your slides are gone and Tessa's slides are up. So just I, do you want to move? Have I got rid of mine now? I'm fiddling here. It's, it's not surprising yeah. they've appeared. Uh, shall I? I'll close. That's good. They've appeared. <laughs> well, it's good, but I'm about to. Are you sure you wanted to leave? I'm now. Hopefully, I haven't completely destroyed this. Let okay, so I can now see your slides. Right. Okay. So should I share again? Thank you very Please much. Share. So. Okay, so I'm hoping I was roughly up to here um, to say these were the options and this was the option we took. Um, so uh, this is a, a single chamber device, it's an epicardial system. Um, and what we tried to do with this, and it proved very effective, is to get rid of the bradycardia. So whenever she dropped into that two to one um, rate and anything, in fact, below um, 85 beats a minute, she would then pace and that eliminated her VT. And this is rarely seen in long QT where you have bradycardia dependent VT. I'm happy to report that she is 15 months old. Therefore, I'm 15 months into consultant life. Um, we're both thriving, I hope. Um, and she is on spectacular doses of nadolol and spironolactone, which I'm hoping to reveal uh, to reduce over time. Um, of a final note, if anyone's interested, is that to allow home monitoring, she also had a reveal device implanted. Um, so I hope that was interesting. I'm not going to do that. Well, you so let do me your stop second sharing. case if you want. No, 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 no go for it, go for it. <laughs> Are you sure? Yes. Thank you. Over to you, Aoife. No problem. One sec. Let me share. OK, can you see mine now? Yes, yes, you can see it. OK, fantastic. OK, so um, my case um, is a cardiomyopathy, obviously, since that was my topic. So my patient is a 15 year old girl um, who was previously fit and well. Um, she had COVID at the end of last year um, and then following this was having lots of recurrent headaches and so presented to her local a &E in January of 2022 for review. For some reason, I'm not quite sure why, they did an ECG as part of her workup and she was found uh, to have an abnormal ECG and so was referred for cardiology review. Um, from the ED, uh, the past medical history was just that she had been on inhalers for asthma for a couple of years, but nothing else of note. So this was her ECG in the a and &E. um, So I know we can't ask questions, so I'll just talk through myself, but I'm sure you can appreciate that it is abnormal. Um, she's got left axis deviation um, and she's got some ST elevation in lead three AVR um, and V1. And she's also got um, ST depression in lead one and AVL. So quite an abnormal ECG um, for both an adult and a child, but um, especially in a child, we wouldn't see this. 
So she was referred to her local paediatrician where she was seen quite quickly um, a week or two later um, and she had an echocardiogram. So it's a paediatrician who can perform echoes. Um, and this showed concentric left ventricular hypertrophy with dynamic systolic function and mild mitral regurgitation. She also had a 24 hour halter locally, which showed no arrhythmias. And so then she was referred to the inherited service at Great Ormond Street. So um, she was then seen in our clinic a month later in March 22. So on further discussion with her, she described this long standing history of chest tightness and shortness of breath with no specific trigger. Um, but she did say that it was often exertional and she had been on inhalers um, over the last few years, but with no real improvement in her symptomatology. On kind of further review of her family history, there was no known history of cardiomyopathy or sudden cardiac death. Her mum had a history of thyroid toxicosis and the maternal family, there was some distant relatives with premature coronary artery disease, but mum herself had not been screened. And there was a paternal history of adrenal problems and hypertension. And then there was this possible history that dad had had an arrhythmia during a previous anesthesia, but it was very unclear. Um, but he hadn't had an, any other screening. Uh, she had a normal examination. So we obviously did a baseline ECG, which looked quite similar to the one um, in the A&E with this um, ST depression and ST elevation, as well as left axis deviation. And then we did an echo. Um, so I think you can appreciate here from the short axis views that she's got concentric left ventricular hypertrophy. Her maximal wall thickness was around 11, 12 millimetres. So for her age, just kind of upper limit normal, really, um, which is slightly more pronounced in that view, I think. Um, in the parasternal long axis, again, you can see this by or sorry, um, concentric hypertrophy, both of the uh, posterior wall and of the septum with no outflow tract obstruction. And again, in this uh, kind of zoomed four chamber view, you can see the hypertrophy. And in the uh, four chamber view, I think you can appreciate that the left atrium is also a little bit dilated with no significant mitral regurgitation, just some mild MR. Um, and looking at the um, uh, numbers from her echo, you can see that her E to E prime, both septal and lateral, are slightly up for child, but not outside the normal range. But she does have quite a marked um, E to A ratio. So maybe some signs of diastolic dysfunction. So what next? Um, so at this point, um, we obviously had a conversation with the family and um, about the diagnosis of what we felt at this point was probably a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with a restrictive phenotype. Um, we plan for a cardiac MRI, a CPAT, a halter. Um, we sent a cardiomyopathy screen as similar to what I spoke about in my earlier talk um, in terms of casting the net wide to make sure we're not missing any metabolic, uh, neuromuscular, anything like that. Um, a genetic panel for a HCM screen um, and then we advise parental screening. And so my question at this point would be, would anyone start any medications? Um, so her symptoms were a little vague and unclear at this point, um, and so we didn't start anything yet. Um, so she went for her cardiac MRI then in March, um, and this confirmed what we'd seen on echo in that it showed mild LVH, small volumes, um, some near complete obliteration of the cavity in um, systole with dynamic systolic function atrial dilatation and no outflow tract obstruction. But importantly, the MRI also showed that she had late gadolinium enhancement, which we often in our HCM patients wouldn't see with this level of um, wall thickening. Um, in the more extreme hypertrophies, we tend to see kind of patchy late gad throughout the hypertrophied segments. But at this at this wall thickness, we wouldn't usually see LGE. But she had um, LGE of her mid cavity anterior wall, which extended almost into the subendocardium and then some patchy myocardial late enhancement of the mid cavity apical anterior wall also. So you can see here on the short axis cine imaging from the MR that she's got some exaggerated systolic thickening and mild concentric LVH, which we can see at both levels. And again, here in the four chamber view, you can see that the atrium is the left atrium is dilated, dynamic systolic function. And you're gonna have to take my word for it because these are not the best images because the GAD imaging doesn't present um, project well, but she has got focal LGE in the anterior wall, which you can see also in the two chamber view. She had a CPAT, which basically showed that she achieved 51% of her predicted workload. She only had a peak VO2 of 19. She developed symptoms of chest pain and dizziness at peak exertion, um, and she had some ST depression, but nothing particularly um, more than what she had at baseline, and just one singular ventricular ectopic, but nothing sustained, and a normal blood pressure response to exercise. So again, that's her resting exercise, or her resting ECG at exercise, 
and then peak exertion we can appreciate that she's got this ST depression which we'd seen previously but nothing new. So we saw her on that day of all her tests um, and at that point her symptoms were a bit more pronounced and um, she was breathless on relatively moderate exertion. She had exertional chest pain and presyncope but no frank syncope. Um, and interestingly, since we'd last seen her, her GP had found that she was hypothyroid and she'd been started on levothyroxine. Her initial cardiomyopathy screen came back, which showed normal metabolic investigations, normal baseline bloods, a normal troponin and a raised BNP at 800. So what next? <laughs> um, so we felt at this point that she was symptomatic um, and that this was primarily related probably to impaired LV diastolic performance. And so as would be our normal first step, we introduced some beta blocker for her at just a low dose, 1.25 milligrams once a day. So then we saw her again two or three months later in clinic and really she was um, the same, if not a little bit worse on the beta blocker. She was breathless on moderate exertion and she'd also had this kind of funny dizzy episode where her vision went a bit blurry. She didn't lose consciousness, but she had some chest pain. Um, important to note, she, she is quite an anxious girl as well, and, and there was definitely um, building anxiety um, throughout the visits. Um, and so psychology was actually involved from early on with this patient. So this is her ECG uh, at this time in June in clinic. Again, we can see she's got quite marked ST depression and ST elevation. Um, and intraventricular conduction delay that you can see across the um, uh, precordial leads. Her echo was unchanged and again felt that her symptoms were likely due to diastolic dysfunction and microvascular ischemia in the context of this kind of HCM with a, with a restrictive phenotype. So at this point, given her symptoms were so marked, we wanted to ensure there was no provocable left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, although we didn't really feel there was substrate for that, but just to rule it out. Also, um, as I said in my previous um, talk, it is important in these patients um, just to think broadly and, and she did have quite marked um, ST changes and so we wanted to ensure her coronary anatomy is normal so she was booked for a CT scan. She had a two-week Holter monitor on um, at the time which we were waiting for the results and we decided to discontinue her bisoprolol and plan to admit her to our cardiac day ward to start verapamil um, and also as I said involve psychology. So we got her Holter monitor back the following week um, and you can see here um, and in the next slide that she had two episodes of uh, VT and um, one lasting 16 beats uh, and one uh, the fastest being uh, about 200 beats a minute. And so this was from June of this year. Um, she also then had the stress echo, which showed no provocable left ventricular outflow tract obstruction and a CT, which showed a high take of her, of her left coronary, but really nothing of, of significance. So coronaries were normal. So at this point, just wanted to pause and say, so we've got a uh, summarize really. So we've got a 15 year old girl with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with a restrictive physiology, no outflow tract obstruction, quite symptomatic with chest pain, shortness of breath, dizziness, and now on verapamil, she'd been admitted to start that. No history of syncope, but has had a 16 beat run of non-sustained VT and late gadolinium on cardiac MRI. And so what would we want to do next? Um, so at this point, we obviously discussed her in our MDT um, and we decided that she was um, at a point where we would want to proceed with ICD. So given she was 15 and I think about 50 or 60 kilos, um, our preference would have been to try for a subcutaneous ICD. So she came for subcutaneous ICD screening. Um, and for those of you that don't know, we do this via treadmill testing. So the patients are hooked up to um, their leads um, and we check the different vectors um, and different conditions. So supine, lying and standing, running, elevated heart rate. Um, and unfortunately, she failed. So in paediatrics, we, um, in order to go forward with subcutaneous ICD, we like patients to pass in two vectors. Um, but unfortunately, she only passed on one vector in both the left and right position. So she was not able to have a subcutaneous ICD. Um, so we decided we'd go forward with the transvenous. But in the meantime, she was readmitted with worsening chest pain, shortness of breath and a fluttering feeling in her chest and she complained of nausea since starting her verapamil. So we decided to convert her to a different calcium channel blocker and started her on diltiazem at 60 milligrams twice a day. So in August of this year, she underwent a single chamber transvenous ICD. Um, she tolerated this well. She did have one 14 beat run of non-sustained VT on the ward following the ICD, but nothing further and remained well and was discharged home. So we then saw her again in clinic the following month um, in September. Her device 
um, was fine. There were no arrhythmias or therapy since we had seen her. She did have ongoing chest pain and palpitations. However, she did report that she was having an improvement in her symptoms with the introduction of diltiazem. Her ECG and echo were unchanged and her cardiomyopathy panel had come back and didn't show any um, mutation. Um, and so our plan was to increase her diltiazem to 60 milligrams three times a day. So this was her genetic um, testing that initially came back. So um, just important to note here that this initial genetics that she had sent was um, a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy panel. So she had a 26 gene panel that did not identify any um, pathogenic or likely pathogenic sequences. So what next? So I suppose given her phenotype, um, we felt that we needed to cast the net a little bit wider. And so um, we actually sent an extended panel for ACM and DCM genes also. We saw her back in the clinic um, just a couple of weeks ago and her symptoms were a little bit better on the higher dose of diltiazem, but she continues to describe daily episodes of chest pain, breathlessness and minimal exertion, and is still in functional class two. She's now not really managing a full day in school and becomes extremely tired um, and has no episodes of frank syncope, but does continue to um, describe episodes of dizziness and palpitations, although nothing has shown on her device. Importantly, at this clinic visit, she hasn't actually been taking her thyroxine for the last three weeks, and she also hasn't been taking her vitamin D supplementation. So whether there's some confounding factors to her symptomatology with her hypothyroidism, and also, um, unfortunately, parental screening has still not happened. So we are also chasing that up. So her ECG from clinic this month shows, again, marked ST changes, and I think probably a little bit more dramatic than previously with more marked ST depression and elevation and ongoing left axis deviation. Uh, one of our sonographers is adult trained, so you can see the echo is upside down this time, but you can see that it's essentially unchanged with this mild hypertrophy, mildly dilated left atrium. Um, and I don't know why that's not playing, sorry, but again, it just shows the same thing as um, previously with some mild concentric left ventricular hypertrophy. Oh, oh has it crashed my system? Sorry, just one sec, this seems to have had a little meltdown. Nearly at the end. Oh, here we are. So our impression after that clinic was that she was as as oh where are my slides gone here we are and um, that uh, as I said ongoing and kind of maybe slightly worsening symptomatology and as I said multifactorial and um, from the beginning we felt that this was diastolic dysfunction with probably microvascular ischemia um, confounding it um, with underactive thyroid and a probably a psychological overlay. And so our plan is to admit her to the day ward for initiation of renalazine, organize a PVR study to uh, investigate her um, PA pressures and to review her again in three months. And then yesterday we got her extended genetic panel back, uh, which now shows that she is a heterozygous for a pathogenic missense variant in the Desmond gene. And um, so this is a gene uh, that is known to cause various different types of cardiomyopathy and also associated sc with skeletal myopathy. And this particular mutation is felt to be pathogenic. So just a quick word on Desmond cardiomyopathy. Um, it uh, often shows actually a skeletal myopathy phenotype prior to cardiomyopathy. However, this, this may not always be the case, as is the case with our patient. Cardiac involvement can take many forms and really it's, it can run the gamut of all different types of cardiomyopathy and also different cardiomyopathies have been observed with patients within the same family. Um, often they have con associated conduction disease, which we haven't seen yet in our patient, and they are at high risk for arrhythmias. So um, from that case, I think the main learning points are, first of all, pediatric cardiomyopathy can in fact be an incidental finding, as was with this girl. Um, I think this case really highlights the kind of stepwise approach to medical therapy and symptom management. And this really requires um, it is kind of depends on the underlying mechanism um, for the symptoms and also response to therapy. So a big proportion of our hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients, their symptomatology tends to come from outflow tract obstruction. And so our stepwise approach is slightly different with our medications, whereas in this patient, we're looking at more kind of microvascular ischemia, diastolic dysfunction. And so beta blocker, calcium channel blocker, and then renalazine, which is essentially an anti-anginal, was more the stepwise approach we took. And important to see the response and, and, and tailor accordingly. 
Um, I think this case also highlights, I mean, this patient only came to our clinic in March of this year, so we've only been seeing her for maybe seven months and we've seen her probably in clinic six or seven times. So it just shows that kind of regular contact that patients really need early on in the diagnostic process. And also that if the phenotype is not classic, that we need to think broadly in regards to the genetic testing. So she isn't a straightforward, you know, asymmetric septal hypertrophy that fits kind of a HCM phenotype. And so when we cast the genetic net a little bit wider, we found our, our pathogenic mutation. And that is my case. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ethan. Thank you to, to both of you for presenting these very interesting cases. Um, we'll go on to the next presenter because I think then we can round it up with a nice panel discussion afterwards if you're still available because um, your, your, all your cases and your presentations have brought, brought out some um, important questions, I think, that um, would be good to discuss in that, um, in that session.